Thank you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday. Give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I will worship you. Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Give me praise, Lord. I will worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. I'm talking about worship. I'm talking about the grace of God that's covering us. The journey that we have to navigate through, saints, to trust the Lord in this hour, the battle for worship. That's my title today. The battle for worship. For true worship. Because, like I told you yesterday, because there's what we call the rise of false worship. Now let me drink my water for a second. I put I put lemons in here and I put garlic in here. It's been very helpful to me. You need this every day, especially in these days where things are not well. But I want to leave this on here for you. I believe it's going to be a blessing to you uh, as you endeavor to stay Stead of us on God, you endeavor to pray and seek the face of God. You give your life for a reason. Let me begin by that. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. How are you doing? You know, blessings to you, woman of God. You know, hopefully we can share this with a lot of people. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I always feel that it's going to be good. So, I leave this here then in the morning, go about our service, uh, Glory International Church, body of believers, amen. Um, and I want to leave an announcement for you guys on December 12th, we have a prophetic evening, 
with mighty men of God uh, around town and coming from out of town. We're blessing God for uh, the preparation for 2021. This has been a very turmoil, turmoil year. And because of what it's been, we want to set a stage of what we believe that God's going to do for our 2021. We can shift the atmosphere for us to walk in the fullness of this very, um, another year. Hopefully we know, by the grace of God, it is going to be a mighty, mighty strategic year for you and for the body of Christ. Mainly you, I speak about you in the name of Jesus. But I was beginning to say that, um, you know, there's a reason why you give your life to the Lord, to be a God worshiper. You chose God out of the many deities, out of many religious rites in different parts of the world. And you say, you know what, I am open to the things of the kingdom of God, the true living God. I give my heart. I give my allegiance, I give my hope, I walk by, I walk by faith and not by sight. You really make made a decision out of the many deities around the world. You say, you know what, I choose one. I choose this one God, one true living God that I will serve with all my life. And, and I like to say to you, you made a right choice to, to, to choose the Lord. You made a right choice. Because in, in uh, the Old Testament, there's a scripture that says, if I can remember it in Deuteronomy, there is no God in the, on the face of the earth that is so near to us, very near to us, like the God of Israel. Okay? There's no God that is so closer to us. I like that because I always use that as an introduction when I travel you know, I've been traveling around the world and I've met so many people who worship pretty much anything. Some people worship cows, worship chickens, worship uh, precious jewel. A lot of people worship different things. And to the most part, they try their best to think that these deities will give them a little bit of high, a little bit of hope, and only, only to find out they will do that and there's no satisfaction there's an emptiness that still remains. And I, I think I gave you a story some time back. I went, I was uh, in some part of Africa, and they took me to the, one of the remotest places, remotest, way deep in the interior, interior villages, you know, way deep in the interior villages. I don't know, if, I don't know, uh, Davis, if you've gone, you've preached before, way, way, way out there in the woods, in the backside of everything. But I was the type of guy who went everywhere. You told me we go, we go. And uh, so they took me there. When I, when I got over there, I, th I think if I remember the story that I told you, is that they took me by taxi, and then the taxi stopped because out, out after there, there is no more driving that takes place, and you just get on the motorbike, and then you get on the motorbike, takes you somewhere, and it stops. You know, and when it stops, you know, you go way deep. And uh, it stops there, and then there's a river. There's a river, you know. Uh, and you got to cross the river, and the water's running, in, and the water was getting to me right here. So that means, and I have a luggage. I have my bags. I'm, I'm coming from the city, uh, prestigious guy, and, and, you know, anointed of the Lord. You know how it is when you feel like you, you're coming from a mega church, and you're all hooked up. I was, even though I was dressed, I never thought I was going right in there. They told me. Uh, that that's where I was going. I could have just maybe changed, what, you know, but I went there with nicer stuff. They're taking me way deep. And I'm like, Lord, does he take all of, this, all of this? And yet God said, yes, right over there, wherever, where you're going. This is almost what? Uh, we, where the bike has taken us is almost from the main road. It's almost like another, you know, how many miles right there. And then, and then I look at the river and I'm like, what are we going to do? I say, you know, Pastor, they're telling me, those people who are bringing me there, say, we're going to have to cross here. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I looked at the water, but I'm not the type of guy that I'm going to back down. I'm not going back because, you know, I think because I was younger, I was zealous. I said, whatever it costs, I'm going. And so I crossed the river 
with my luggage on, on my head. I wanted to make sure my Bible is not wet and everything. And I, after crossing it, the water was very cold because it was coming from the top of the mountains. You know, I love this story because it's an adventurous journey. And most people don't realize, they think, oh yeah, you know, this guy's just, now Mike's talking about, you know, TV networks and everything and ministry and all that. You know, we never began there. We never began just, you know, to be lead and everything like that. You know, I don't do celebrities. I can stop anywhere, two, three, four, whatever. You know, so I, I get over there. And then we had to go on top of the mountain. By the time you, after the river, you now, you now have to steep going up the hill, which is almost a half a mile. And then it rains on while we're going there. So now I'm wet. All of my clothes are gone and stuff. And we get over there. Before I could get over there, I had the sound. I had a sound, a loud sound of people. This was not like 100 people. It wasn't 200. It was almost like 400, 500 people. We're up in those mountains. We're up in those mountains. They were worshiping. They were praying. And I'm not talking about this religious prayer. I'm not talking about this kind of cozy prayer. These people had nothing. They lived in villages. They eat just the, whatever is in the village. They don't even go shopping anywhere in, in the shopping arcades and stuff. But they're right there. And the first thing that dawned on me was this. I said, Lord, this is so interesting. I got overjoyed. I was excited. I was so happy. And I said, Lord, you have people here too. You have a people that worship you here too. And what's it? not only that, he said, you have a people that worship you, but you're here too. Your presence is here. I could feel it before I could even get to them. I could feel it. And I get over there. I could not even wait. I could not wait to get over there. I mean, 500 people right, who live in those mountains way deep. Their, their civilization is cut off from anywhere, but they're worshiping God. They don't worship idols. They're worshiping a true living God. And the presence of God was heavy, was so deep, was so powerful. I loved it. I enjoyed it. They didn't have a form of Godness. They didn't have, you know, security guards. They didn't have backlights. They didn't have the smoke. They didn't have, they were actually the church is even under tree. They didn't have all of the things we think are the presence of God. They didn't have it. What they heard was one formula, was the word of God and the voice that cries out to God for a mighty move of God. And I'm the one that God has given the privilege. They were not privileged. I was the one that was privileged that God could take me out of my commonwealth and put me in a group of people that are crying out to God, that are praying for rain. The rain that fell on me while we were going up the mountains was so beautiful, was so sweet. It, I felt like it was a blessing because it's out of those places. It is out of those places that God takes me out of there and it begins to thrust me into the nations and begins to open mighty doors. Because I obeyed God to go places where nobody can go, where other people can despise. But yet the presence of God is more greater and mightier and more exciting. You know what I mean? And I tell you the truth, I got over there and people were praising God. Okay? They were praising God. What kind of people am I talking about? I'm talking about five. Have you ever seen 500 midgets? 500 short people on the top of the mountains. They are worshiping God. They know God too. They are worshiping God too. They bless God too. They know God. I was so moved. I was so challenged. I was so excited. I felt like somebody had given me a million dollars. You know what I say? God is not a respecter of any person. He's not a respecter of any person. And those who know Him in any nation, whether you are a woman or or oh, man, I have a problem with men who have issues with women preachers. You know, I have an issue with that. What the problem is there? You know, anyone that loves the Lord, that serves the Lord, is honored by God to carry out an assignment. You know about Catherine Kuhlman, you know, Edward Edder, all these mighty, there's a lot of these patriarch women that God used mightily, that the world mighty because there was no one in the gap except them 
So here's what I'm saying to you, saints. I go in a place that has no formula. They don't have to wait for a keyboardist and a good, nice worship leader, supposedly with a very good, nice haircut, okay, to come and put in his vocals. And the people who are, he's singing to, you know, they're just standing over there. These people just went into prayer. They have a dusty church. A dusty church. And they began to dance for the Lord. You hear me? Okay? They began to dance for the Lord. Guess what? And the dust was going everywhere. All right? The dust was lifting up. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. But they are excited about God. They are driven about God. They are overjoyed about God. Their life is off the hook. And the presence of God is there. They don't have everything we got to... See, here in the Western culture, we have everything we need to feel like we can impress God. But it's so dry. It is so powerless. There is none of it. And we still deny the power of God thereof. And we think it's God, but it's not of God. And you find people that don't have a formula. They have a voice. They have reverence. They seek the face of God. They know there is only one true living God. And they will worship him in truth and spirit. And the presence of God comes. Michael, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to bash our worship? Are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? No, I'm challenging us to return to the true living God. I'm challenging us for us to get away from this mainstream Christianity that's trying to weave God to a lesser vessel, to a lesser deity. In other words, we are standing in the way of the greatest move of God. We are hindering God ourselves. We say we love Him, but we hinder Him. We are fighting Him with our broken theology, the false religious theology that we've been taught by men who didn't know God. We have to return to God. And if there is any time, it's now. And why is it now? Because, because the evil spirits from hell I saw a walk to make sure they push the body of Christ completely out of the mainstream and kick it away on the side cop that we are, we are not relevant anymore. Our voices are not relevant because some of us, some of us have gone on national TV and made a mockery out of us. They acted like they knew God. They acted that they represented God. And all of a sudden they said, the world said, you know, look at them. Look at them. There is no way. Because let me tell you the truth. God knows how to represent himself. God knows how to speak for himself. God knows how to order and prophesy and say what it has to be done. And when he says it, it is what it is. We cannot go about our religious, false religion and phoniness cannot be equated, cannot be, be equal to the almighty God. It cannot let God be God and let every man be a liar. Let God be God. The battle for our worship is a very crucial one because that's what for 2,000 years, this battle that I'm talking about is not today, not because I'm talking about it now. It's been there for 2,000, soon after Jesus rose from the dead, okay? The religious phoniness of the Sadducee and the Pharisees and the council and the magistrates, okay? And the Romans, they went to war against the resurrection of Jesus. They went to war. And so what I'm talking about is not just today, okay? Soon as Jesus rose from the dead, they killed him thinking they're going to shut this entire thing out. They put him on the display, Calvary. Calvary was a mighty hill. So when, they, when the Romans put you on the mighty hill, that means they have stopped your movement. They stopped your worship. When the people began to worship him in every city, miracles, signs and wonders happened. They were so angry, especially the Sadducees, the religious people of that time. Do you know that it's the religious people of that time that fought Jesus even more? Do you know they fought him? Soon as Jesus, they knew that he rose, you know, they killed him thinking they're going to shut down the thing. They didn't realize that when they try to put him out, okay, he ushered in the era and the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. 
And when the Holy Spirit was ushered in, okay, you would not stop the fire. You try to stop the fire here, and it opens up there. You try to stop it there, it goes to Africa. You try to stop it in Africa, it comes to the United States. You try to stop it in the United States, it goes back to Africa. That's why today there is a mighty move of God in Africa. You cannot stop this move of God. Oh, that reveals the true nature of God, that reveals the true kindness of God, that reveals the essence and the sovereignty of God. No man, no man, I don't care what politician, I don't care what president, I don't care what senator, I don't care what laws, I don't care what's in the book. All I know that those who try, okay, those who try to make sure they want to make sure they stumble on this chief cornerstone, they will be shattered by the chief cornerstone. That's what the Bible says. That stone that was rejected by the builders has become the chief cornerstone. And those who try to crush on it, they will be shattered. That's what the Bible says. And therefore tonight, I want to call for two worshipers. For two people who know how to call on their God. I want to see a generation of mighty worshipers, mighty men of God, who are delighted in their true worship. Are we up against some battle? Yes, we are. Are they jealous that we have a God so near to us that when we pray, when you pray, when you seek His face, where you are, not in the building, not in the building. I'm talking about where you are right now. And what makes the difference is the Holy Spirit of God will invade your life. The Holy Spirit of God will invade your life where you are. You are in tune with God right now. Turn it, turn on the tune right now. You will see what will happen. The joy will be back. Restoration will be back. Miracle signs and others will be released in your life. The goodness of God will be released and much more. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because the true worshippers don't worship Him in Mount Holland or Mount Sinai or in Jerusalem. They worship Him in truth and spirit. And that's what the enemy hates. That's what the enemy hates. That's what the devil hates. So what? Let him hate it because he understands that the frequency of our true worship pushes back the darkness. The frequency of our true worship pushes back the darkness of false worship, false prophecy, pagan Christianity, all of that that has tried to hinder the move of God. So as I tell you my story, you know, I was moved that I went to the place where you wouldn't even think that God can visit and the presence of God was even much there more. There was no any gimmicks. No, no choreographing anything. There was a true presence of God. And on that place, miracles, signs and wonders happened. People got healed. There was deliverance. That's what tells you that God is not a respect of any person. And therefore tonight, we win this battle. Because 2,000 years ago, they tried to stop this movement. They try to stop what God, even right now they are conniving an idea. They are mistaken that our DNA is not of this world. Our DNA is not of this world. Our DNA is not of this world. Our DNA is of the kingdom of God. Our DNA is of the kingdom of God. You hear me saints? Our DNA is of the kingdom of God. You hear me? Say it again. I want you to decree that right now in the name of Jesus. Our DNA is of the kingdom. And that's what the enemy cannot stop. <laughs> that's what the enemy cannot stop. That's what he cannot break down. That's why you have a life in him. The hope of glory. That's why in, in, in him we move and have our being. Can nobody stop the move of God? See, I wanted to show you something very crucial because in the book of First Corinthians, the scripture, the word of God tells, tells us, the one verse I can read, he said, be, one verse, verse 14, okay? First Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to, to, to never forget that because most of you don't even have your Bible right now. Therefore, my beloved, it says, flee from idolatry. Paul writes the church in Corinth. Why? 
does he write the church in Corinth? He writes a letter to them and he says, I beseech you, flee from idolatry. You would think Paul would just go in the marketplace where people don't know God, all right? And tells them, you know what, guys, I see. That's what he did when he was in Crete and Athens because all these regions were actually pagan idol worshiping cities and typically their historical businesses were all idol businesses, all right? But he goes to a church, one of the churches he planted over there, and he warns them about idolatry. He tells them, flee from it. Why was it important for them to remind, for him to remind them that they should flee from it? Because what's interesting about the, this church, they were so broken, they were so divided, you know, on, on their worship and, their, and, their, and who they, they worship during the day like right now. Like Sunday morning, they're in the church praising God. And in the evening, after the preacher's gone, they go back up on the mountain to go and worship the goddess Diana. Okay, and the other name, I forgot the other name, you know, the, the pronunciation of the name which I've forgotten. So during the day, they're in the house of God, and during the night, they go and offer sacrifices to the God of the sun. Oh no, the God of fertility. So they were confused. They're serving two masters ago. They love this God. They hear from Paul. But at the same time, they want to go up on the mountain and offer sacrifices. So there's a little bit of confusion. And Paul has to tell them, hey, I understand this culture and business is full of it. It's full of what? It's full of pagan idol small gods. But I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that you cannot create, you can, will not build golden images, which... You know, the word of God told us in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, you shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness or anything that's in heaven above that's ever. You will not do that. That's what the word of God told us. He said, do, do not try to bring your small gods and bring them into the house of God and try to measure them to the bigness of our God. He don't work that way. You will not choose... You will not serve two masters, two masters at the same time. He said, you will not bring anything and anything besides God, above God. You will not. It doesn't work. It's going to backfire. But automatically, when you become an idol worshiper, sometimes it's even the small, the small addictions. Let me talk about the small addictions in our lives. Whatever it is that we make an idol that becomes too way important, too way too good for God, that takes the attention away, it becomes an idol. And that idol has to be shattered. It has to be broken. Because when it becomes a habit, it becomes an idol, it eats you up and your mind conceives it. And when your mind begins to conceive it, your mind begins to disregard God, the true living God. Your mind begins to fight God. And here's when you know that you begin to, to, to disregard God. It's when you always, anytime the word of God comes to you, it comes with conviction and you're very defensive about it. You, you even have some scriptures to throw at it because you want to keep your thing going. And we have today, we have what we call new ages. The new ages have walked in into our pews and they're very defying against the word of God and they bring in every scripture they can. They, they cannot even throw in a little bit of grace people, grace ideas and grace everything. Because they don't want to be, ex they don't want to be separated. They do not want to be separated from that very, very bondage. They are so much enslaved to this very thing and this battle is going on every single day i pray in the name of jesus saints that the, that god breaks this very addiction of pagan christianity that's in the house of god it is a reason why the church is powerless it is a reason why the church is weak it's a reason why the church is given up it's a reason it's the reason it is a reason, but it's got to be broken. It's got to be, if we're going to see the greatest awakening,
the greatest mighty power of God invade the move of God. It, the first thing that happens is the stronghold of witchcraft, voodoo, it's got to be broken. It's got to be defeated. It's got to be broken from every family lineage. It has to stop from you. If the great, great, great began to do that, whatever they did, rebuke it. The curse has to be broken. The curse has to be defeated. It has to be uprooted in the name of Jesus. It has to. It has to go away. There's no way. There is no way. There's no way it stays. There's no way it can stay. Not right now. I told you yesterday we're in the showdown, but this is a showdown we win. Because the enemy that's been hidden, the very thing that's been dormant for ages, is on the rise. Humanism, atheism, communism, socialism, you know, all the isms are on the rise right now. And because they're on the rise, they are coming after the move of God. But guess what? No weapon formed against you and I will prosper. No weapon formed. Do you agree? If you agree, I want you to say amen. All right? Because I told you yesterday, never set your eyes on something smaller than your God. Never set your eyes, never set your spirit on something that's smaller than your Jesus. Never do that. That's why God says, you cannot add to me, you cannot subtract from me. Even your theology, wherever you learned it from, it has to be re, re it has to be re-examined. It has to be re-examined. Paul made sure, you know, Paul made sure when he made a statement is that if any man preach this word, even if the angels come, if it's not the true living word of God, let them be a cast. What we preach, because you wanted to make sure that what was being taught about the true living God is not false. Even if the angels come and try to teach the thing false, let them be a cast. Can nobody add to God? Can nobody try to take away from God? And I can stand over here with confidence and speak about Him and brag about Him because I've watched Him uproot demonic forces in places and cities and nations I've gone. I've, I have seen God bring deliverance upon them. I'm talking about real deep deliverance of the legions. I've watched Him do great and mighty things. I have a right to talk about Him. He's a mighty God. He's a good God. You hear me say it. And therefore tonight, I cannot, I cannot get undone with teaching this. You know, I can't wait for a church in the morning. Amen? What is the gospel of the kingdom? What is it about? Is it about you getting saved? Is it about you changing? You see, the problem with false the false theology, we've turned about, we've turned this true worship into only getting saved. It ain't enough about getting saved if you cannot measure your ability to know who you truly worship and your deep devotion and allegiance to Him. It's not enough to be a saved if you cannot worship Him in truth and spirit. And I'm not talking about attending church alone. I'm talking about a deep personal devotion in your spirit. Deep, personal, driven hunger for God. Michael, how do I know that? The, the Word of God tells us by faith. Blessed are they that believe. Before they see, blessed are they. In other words, believing the Son of God. That we are the, we are the true sons of God. Blessed are they. You hear me? So guess what? If we are going to change the world, if we, if the world is going to have a mark of God, especially for we who have been born again, we might as well worship a true living God. Because, because guess what? The world is not messed up. Okay? 
The world is not broken or scandalized. Let me use that statement. Because they see us having a lot of freedom. They are not so scandalous. Let me use that word. Do you know what really, really messes up the world today? Is that those who are supposed to have the light, the light of Jesus, they're supposed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth have chosen a false deity and a fakeness rather than walking in the truth and the power of God. Do you know what the apostles did? Do you know after Jesus rose again, he told them, go in the upper room and the Spirit of God will come upon you. That was, Jesus left them in a city that had just crucified him. The city was very hostile. The city was so dangerous. The city was an enemy of the gospel, was the enemy of the word of the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus told them, stay in the upper room. But when the power of God came from above and fell on them, oh my God, the presence of God hid the place. The presence of God hid the place. The fame went out about the word of God. That Peter stands up and tells them that men, men of the city, we're not drunk because it's just 3 a.m. in the morning. But we are full of the Holy Spirit. That same Jesus you crucified has rose again. You know, he's reminding them that what they did. He said, it was your fault. Because if you didn't do that, guess what? It was your fault. Even though it was your fault, it was a benefit to us. Because the power of the Holy Ghost has been has fallen on us. As he's reminding them about that. There was a shift that took place. There was a dynamite that took place because the person of the Holy Spirit now came upon them and empowered them to spread the gospel in their region. The Bible said 3,000 people accepted to be God worshippers not idol worshiper. They came out of pagan religious deities of that time. And you think the resistance could stop, but the resistance continued. But the more the resistance I get them continued, guess what? The power of God increased. Right in the midst of resistance, there was more power. There was more glory. There was more miracles. There was more great things that took place. Because can nobody try to put God under? Can nobody shut the voice of God? You know, the last 2,000 years, a lot of lives have come. A lot of lives have been taken. They have been murdered. In my country, Uganda, you know, you know what happened? 37 Uganda murders were, were burnt. They like the king, the king who believed in idol worship. The king of that time who believed in outer worship put 37 young men on fire, daylight, because Christianity was going like rapid fire, and because it was going, he was losing subjects. You know why? You know why the enemy hates God's true people? Because when we give our life to the Lord, we are not subjects of the devil, we are God's subjects, we are God's ambassadors, we are God's joint heirs. We are a royal priesthood. We are no longer subject and enslaved to the yoke of Satanism, witchcraft, and all those forces. So it makes the enemy, every time we populate heaven, okay? Anytime many people enter heaven and their names are written in the Bible's book of life, the enemy is so angry. But so be it. Who cares? Because they're not going to go to hell. They're going to go to heaven in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Come on, somebody, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. We love you. We worship. And we adore you. We glorify. 
your name in all the earth. Did you hear that? We glorify his name. See, see what that means. If you want to find your greatest freedom, Enthrone God as Lord and Savior of your life. Every day you wake up, before you step out, make sure that your God is on his throne. Make sure. Michael, how do you do that? Every time you worship him, you know he's seated on his throne. Okay? Every time you wake up, before you put your feet down, Open your mouth and say, I glorify you, I magnify you, I adore you. The moment you say those words, you clear your day from any forces of the enemy against you. Anytime you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I magnify you, I glorify you, you are my king, you are my Lord, you are my savior, you are my fortress, you are my strong tower. I will not depend on the circumstances around me. You are a true worshiper. You start to change your atmosphere on who you adore. Tell me who you adore, you will find his presence. Tell me what you adore the most, that's what you will bow down to. And if it's God, you will have his attention. If it's God, you will have his attention. Therefore, today, we have to remove all the fakeness. We have to remove all this denialism of the power of God. We are either in it completely or we are just faking it. And I'm not the one who's going to fake the presence of God. If it ain't working, it ain't working. But hey, I tapped into a source. I plugged into a voltage that cannot shut down. I plugged in into it. The people that I've surrounded myself growing up, they're power-packed men of God. I can have less of the power of God. You hear me? And I pray that this body of believers, these men and women of God of this day, of this generation, the young men and women will rise up in the power of God. And let's see the greatness of our God. So the Bible tells, Paul tells the Corinth church flee from idol worship. He tells them, hey, I'm gracious to you, but flee. You, don't go back to the God of the fertility. Don't go back to the God of the sun. Don't bring that confusion in the house of God. That's why he wrote them two letters. Go back and read the first book and the first letter and the second letter. He's chastising them. He's preparing them. Anytime somebody writes you the letter twice, it means you've been so strong-willed in your way. And there has to be a change. And that's what Paul speaks of them. They were, they were, they were going through a whole lot of issues. Not only just out of worship, a whole lot of issues. There was a level of brokenness. And what I love about Paul, he's able to bring the true Christ. He sold them. He sold them how God sold them. So that they can fully turn and come back to God. And when I take you back, let me take you one more time before I close, because hey, I got I got a race, I got I got a race. Let's go back to Second Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter six, and listen to what he he tells them again. That means they did not get it in the first letter. Now he's written them a second one, okay? And uh, verse seventeen. In verse seventeen, it says. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. See what he just told them? The first letter he tells them, hey, Flee from idol worship. The second one, he tells them, do not touch unclean things. Well, Brother Mike, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, what do we call it? I've had seven miscarriages. And because of them, I've been losing babies and everything. I might as well try witchcraft. Do you know that some women do that? 
They try to go and say, it hasn't been working. I, I went to so and so to pray for me. And, I, and then they take their womb. I literally know somebody who did that. You know, and took their womb and they go to the witch doctor. The witch doctor lies to them, takes money from them. And the baby they went for that they want to offer their body into this human sacrifice and human witchcraft. Boo. It becomes worse. Becomes very worse. So what Paul is telling them, the church in Corinth is saying, do not touch. Be separate from them. They're ungodly. They're evil. It's literally evil. What is total paganism? It is satanic. It's free, it's, it's Freemason. It's a secret society. They are, they worship Lucifer. Get away from them. Come out from among them. Get out of Babylon. Break the cycle of the demonic forces around you in the name of Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not put your hands. When you go in the entire Old Testament, the one thing, the one common denominator he ever told the people he chose, he said, you will not worship other gods. Thou shalt not mingle with them. Thou will not even go and intermarry with them because, not because I didn't want you to marry them, it's because of the gods they serve. If you ever bring them into your cup, they, you will become their slaves. And the children of Israel, most times they broke the law and they messed it up. The consequences of that is that they were enslaved by the demonic. The worst thing of all is for you to choose other gods, idols, and they enslave you, they break you, they steal from you, they mess you up, they bind you, they make you lose your light, lose your joy, lose your liberty. You lose everything. America, return to God. Return to God. We go into this battle I can finish this tonight I can finish it tomorrow this subject is long saints it's a battle for our worship are you strong enough are you powerful enough Are you strong enough? Can you defend your faith? Can you put your line on it? Let me tell you a story before I close. This is going to bless you. I think maybe I shared it, but let me tell you this. I had a fellowship many years ago that I began. I was, I was the leader of it. And uh, in that fellowship, I taught, just like I'm teaching you right now, it was very powerful. I remember that I took an entire month, I was preparing the body of Christ at, at that time, especially in the fervency of their faith, defending their faith. And I broke down how the church had gone through persecution and how the early church stood in boldness. And I told and told and told, you know, and, and I, it was very impactful, it was so powerful. When we finished the 30 days, I told them, I said, the test is going to begin right after 30 days over. I said, the real test is going to begin because we were going to have a break for like a week or two or something like that. So we had a break. And uh, so everybody went back. You know, they wanted to go for holidays and everything like that. So one of our members in the fellowship, one of our members in the fellowship, listen to this. Went, went to another country. This is not here in the U.S. This was outside of, outside of here. So when she went out of the country, she was a young, devoted, on fire lady. You know? She surprised me a lot. When she went over there, in their neighborhood that day, and most of you have been hearing 
Christians being going through, you know, a lot of havoc. They are being attacked for their faith and everything. So that morning was not a good, blessed day for her. She went to a neighborhood church. And in that church, as she's worshiping, this batch of guys walked in there. They walked in with guns and knives and everything like that. So they told everybody, those of you who worship God, stand over here. And those who don't, just walk. Those of you who do, we're going to kill you one by one. Those of you who don't, just, just go. And the young lady who just showed up like a Saturday was there that morning. Left our fellowship after teaching. I didn't even know that what I was teaching was going to prepare her and prepare the rest of the other guys to defend their faith because all of them went through pretty much the most similar attacks when they went back to where they live. Especially some of, some of it was happening through family members who were disowning them because they accepted Jesus as their personal savior. And now she's faced with the choice of life. She was faced with the choice of life. And when they walked in, you know what they said? And it's interesting, the people walked out. It, it's not even interesting, it is very alarming. People walked out. The people who pretended that they loved God so much, they sang to him, walked out. And the young lady who had been in my fellowship stayed. She stayed over there. She stood. And that shocked. She was a young lady. She was almost like probably what? 18? She stayed. And uh, she stayed. And you know what they did? They looked back and the pastor of the church was on the way out. The members were out on the way out. And guess what? The lady said, and you know, guess what? They went to her and one of the guys got one of the hammers and smashed her toe. They smashed, they smashed her toe. Boom! They hit it. She cried. As she was crying, one of the other guys came to her and said, don't. We are very surprised at her. She looks like she doesn't even belong here. Okay? Stop. Don't kill her. She, they let her go. Because they were surprised that she stood the test of time. And they let her alive. Because she, she, they saw an 18 year old girl put her life on the line for Jesus. And everybody left. And I know some of you would say, oh, that, that's what I should do. That's what I would do. She came back and met me and told me, Pastor, I, I asked her about her toe. I said, what happened? She said, you know what? I went out when you, after you told us, thank, thank God you told us to be strong for our lives. I said, but this is what happened. My toe was hit. They were, they were going to kill me. And these people came in the church. They were going to put it on fire. But they told us, those who love God, stay here. And those of you, go. And guess what, saints? There are times that comes in your life that you won't play God. We cannot play God no more. The battle for our worship. It, 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 no joke. I, I have never been challenged by my own member because she, I had never put my life on the line to that extent. I, I didn't even know at the time I, I, I could do that. I would preach. I, would, I had life. Anybody can swing the Bible on the pulpit. Anybody can be eloquent on throwing all the Hebrew scriptures on national TV and everything like that. But we're talking about putting your life on the line for the gospel. And I, it's me. When she gave me that testimony, I humbled myself because she showed me that her faith in God was greater. She came on the brink of it and God saved her. And God preserved her. 
And that testimony challenged the very people who were going to do it. It challenged them. It challenged me. Why did I share that with you? If your level of Christianity is minimal, it can be challenged. And all that will be left will be nothing. I know you didn't give your life to the Lord for the just cause, just because you're looking for and running to a famous preacher or anybody. You gave your life for a real, real cause. You chose that you would never worship other gods except one true living God. And therefore tonight, I want to remind you, live for Christ alone. Live for His purpose. He said to us, we will go through so much tribulation for His name's sake. He told us everything. He told us that we are lambs being sent to the wolves. So the wolves are looking for us. And we are blameless. But today, I want to remind somebody, this is blessing someone. Don't take your walk with God lightly. Fight for it. Defend it. Come out from among them. Don't touch unclean things. Remove the small idols in your heart, in your spirit. I believe that when we start to remove all these things out of our spirit, a mighty presence of God will hit us. And greater and mighty things will happen. I hope that this message blesses you. I hope that God, you can send this to your friends. May we rise up before God to do great and mighty things for the Lord. Our God is great. Our God is mighty. Our God is everlasting. Our God is holy. It has called us to be holy like Him. And every single day, guys, you will see me brag on God. Every single day on our soon coming network, we want you to pray for us because we are setting up our production center. We are believing God that we, we will finish the production center before launch day. Okay? Some of you think this is our production center. No, 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 not yet. Okay? Where we can, we're going to be inviting mighty men of God to join us. So let's take the world, the world by storm. Let's tell the world we serve one true God. A mighty revival is going to break out. We're going to see mighty deliverance. I want to team up with men of God that believe, like I believe, that we win. The word of God says we win. We dismantle every godlessness, every lawlessness, every rebellion, every apathy, every lukewarm spirit, every attack. That has made men try to make God of less importance in our society. In the name of Jesus. We push back against the darkness. We push back against the, the darkness that comes from the east, from the west, from the south. We push it back. We push back the enemy's agenda. We push it out from Africa, from America, from the east and west, from Europe. Every satanic agenda that wants to come against the plan of God. We defeat it in the name of Jesus. And somebody join me to say an amen. Join me tomorrow. Where we're going to continue with this. We're not done. We're going to break it down. And we're going to see victory. We have the victory. Come on guys. Love you. Bless God for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.